This episode is sponsored by Linode. Do you need a Linux server for your latest creation? Then check them out. They provide native SSD storage, 200 gigabit per second network connections, Intel E5 processors, and top of the line hardware to run your servers on. It deploys Linux in seconds from a Linode cloud and you can choose your Linux distribution and node location right from the manager. They have locations in Asia, North America, and Europe and a suite set of tools to make it easy to manage it. If the web interface isn't your thing, they also have an API and a command line. They also provide two-factor authentication, IPv6, DNS manager, plumbing, scaling, and everything else you would want. So get the most out of your Linux node by checking them out at linode.com or devchat.tv slash linode. Hello, and welcome to React Native Radio, episode 91. I'm your host, Snatter Dabbit. Today on our panel, we have Spencer Carley of Handlebar Labs. Hey there, everyone. And today, our special guest is Ovidu Cherik. Kesh, I know I did that wrong, but uh, welcome to the show, <laughs> Ovidu. That was pretty close. Um, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely, man. Thanks for coming on. Um, so our topic today is going to be testing React applications, and this also goes for React Native. So we're kind of just going to be talking about testing in general. But uh, before we get into the topic, can you talk a little bit about how you got into programming quickly um, and maybe like what you're doing right now in re the React ecosystem and kind of what you're working on? Sure. So I'm going to try to tell a story. I'm not sure how long this is going to take. <laughs> but the the reason why I want to tell the story is because um, I feel like even though there's a lot of people programming now, there's still the, the misconception that you either have the programming gene or not. And I think that's completely false. So um, I got into programming in high school. And I, I grew up with a brother that started programming really early. So he used to go to this, um, like competitions and like a, be like a prodigy. So I was more into arts. Uh, I used to draw and also paint a bit. And then somehow I just thought that this is not for me and probably I'm never going to program. But then. Um, I was in high school in the first year of high school and I didn't go to art school because I didn't think that's, that's, uh, the future is going to be solid in that direction, even though most of my friends went there. So I went to this technical high school, but I didn't go to a programming class either because I didn't have good enough grades. So I spent one year in this high school and I didn't enjoy any of the classes. So I felt like I needed to do something. And then at the end of the first high school year, I, I wanted to transfer. So I either transferred to an art school back with my old friends, or for some reason, I thought it's a good idea to try to learn programming and transfer to one of these uh, other classes from the same high school that I was in. And I remember I went to my brother and I said, uh, look, this is what I want to do. I want to. I want to transfer. I want to learn programming, and uh, because if you want to transfer, they they give you an exam, so they only test you in the classes that you haven't been doing in the past year. So I'll never forget this because my brother just took a an old C book from the shelf, like a three um, three finger book, and just threw it in my lap, and said, "Here, learn this." So over that summer vacation. I just read every page of that book. And then when I went to take the exam to transfer, um, I didn't do very well because I've been doing a lot of um, theory, but I, I managed to get the grade to, to transfer. And then once the next year started in, the, in my new programming class, I thought that I was going to be so behind because I missed one year. But it turns out that if you study an entire book of C during summer vacation, you're actually going to end up um, pretty ahead in your programming class. So um, it was a good surprise to see that I was doing very well once I moved to the new class. And things started picking up from, from there. Um, I, so yeah, I think, uh, I think you can learn it at any point, and you, you should never think that it's not for you. Hopefully that didn't bore people too much. No, no, totally. That's interesting that you learned from a C textbook and now you're kind of doing React development. But I guess just understanding, you know, the 
programming and the logic in general is something you can take from language to language. So, um, yeah, yeah, this was a long time ago. So, um, I got into web development, um, I think because I liked visual stuff. So, uh, I, I found out that you can, you can code stuff and put them on the screen. And that was very exciting. So aside from the, the, like the C programming that, that I was doing in school, um, I didn't really focus on that too much. I, I started doing web development and also because I wanted to make money as soon as possible. So I started doing programming, uh, like freelancing gigs in, in high school. And that was a lot of fun because I found out that I can make money doing something that I like. And I, I ended up skipping college altogether because by the time I finished high school, I was just having too many clients that I was juggling with. And I, I just couldn't put myself to school any longer when I, when my life was already so exciting. That's so cool. So by the time you were done with high school, you were already making enough money to not need to go to college. Yeah, I was already making enough money to move, uh, to leave my hometown and, and, uh, pay for my rent and everything in, in this bigger town in Romania. So I, I mean, I had the option to, to work and also study, but I think I just wasn't, I was a bit too lazy for that. So I just, I just went on that route and started making my own life and being independent and moving out and also having some, some free time as well. So what exactly are you doing at this second within your career? Do you do, do you still do freelancing and consulting and how kind of, um, how did you get, I'm, I'm kind of curious just how you got your clients to begin with, even back in high school. Yeah. That's, um, okay. So the, the short answer is yes, but it's been a long journey since then. And, uh, it's a completely different type of uh, freelancing that I used to do. So back then it was just, um, this websites like rent a coder you may have heard of. I'm not sure if they're still around. They probably are, or I'm sure there's a lot of them now. And it was just this thing where I, I didn't even disclose my name. So I don't think this uh, people actually knew who, who I was, how old I was. I was 14, but it was also very small gigs so you'd see like a like an offer to build this maybe like a flash banner or like a javascript drop down or sometimes something bigger but just um, some some tasks were just like 30 50 dollars which was a lot of money back then um, i remember getting the first 500 dollar task which is which was a big thing and then it's once you do a couple of these, you have a profile and you have a ratings, so it's it becomes easier to get uh, jobs. But this was in high school, of course, when I was happy to work on anything, and I I, I, I used to do front end, back end, um, like Flash, JavaScript, I don't know anything web related. But then I got so after I moved out, I started working with a company from Bucharest, which is Romania's capital. And they, after a while, they offered to give me a full-time job and to kind of help me move there. And that, that seemed even more exciting because I had the opportunity to work with peers and to learn from them and also to move to an even, even bigger city. And I did that. So I worked there for a bunch of years. I, I continued to, to, I think, to, to be full scale. So work with any type of project. They, they were a studio, so they would take projects from, from clients all over the world, and we just make design and development for them. And I, I continued to live in Bucharest for eight years until um, one year ago. And during this time, I worked on in four companies, uh, all sorts of companies, so design development studios, even uh, a branding agency at some point. Then I went to a startup and began focusing heavily on JavaScript because the, the times of the single page app were, were um, arising and, and I felt that's really exciting. So I worked there for a couple of years. Then that startup was acquired for this company called Hootsuite that you may have heard of from Canada. And I ended up staying there as well. 
uh, which was um, exciting because I got uh, I got promoted. So I was I was an engineering manager for for two and a half years there until I decided that after after eight years in companies. I want to go back to freelancing. I've learned so many things. I and I want to go back to having this freedom and take just a take it easy for one year or two. So that's that's the the company route. I haven't said a lot about React. So I started working with React by the time the the, the startup called Uberview that I was working in was acquired by Hootsuite, uh, and we've been building a single page app with. Backbone and um, what I, what else was uh, was popular during then like required JS and we built our own framework which had these widgets which are somewhat similar to React components but it, it was it was much more complex and hard to work with so after two years we we got to the point where this code base was really hard to work with. But, you know, in a startup, you can't just say, let's just rewrite everything. So you have to push through. But then we got acquired and um, the incentives kind of changed. Uh, there was also a period of uncertainty because some people left from our side. Um, so I felt like this is uh, this is now or never. This is the opportunity to pitch trying something, writing something uh, from scratch because we were going to integrate our product with the main company's product anyway. Um, so this this felt like a good excuse. And to to be able to make this pitch, I wanted to research what what was the the leading technology at that point. And I just got on this um, journey of, of reading a lot of uh, articles and staying up to date with what's happening in the JavaScript community. Uh, because I haven't, uh, I I didn't know about React at that point. I, I think it was just a few months old. So after reading, actually the funny thing is I, I, I've i written down like the specification of what this framework should be able to do before finding React. And it was pretty similar to what React was doing. Because I was envisioning this um, strong component model uh, where you can easily... Um, load any component separately and test it separately and, you know, mock it with all this sort of data because the main issue that we had debugging the old code base was just um, not being able to separate one component and know where a bug is coming from and just uh, have everything be very interconnected. So after I, I knew what I was looking for, when I, when I stumbled upon React, it was like... Um, a, a dream come true. It just it just clicked instantly. I know for a lot of people it was controversial, but for me, I just uh, I fell in love with it immediately, and then pursued um, trying to convince my company to make the switch. And lucky enough for me, that actually worked. So I went on a journey uh, of two and a half years where I I also got promoted, so I got to lead a team of of. Um, anywhere between four to six developers at any given point in time and writing a, a fresh new code base in, in React that was supposed to adapt to the needs of the new company. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's very, very uh, in-depth. I appreciate the the answer, the in-depth an answer. But um, so now that we're um, kind of in into a little bit of, of, of React as a topic, can you talk about your like general overview of how someone should go about testing. I know testing is a very general term right, uh, in the way we're kind of talking about it. We're not talking about unit testing or end-to-end -end testing or integration testing. We're just talking about testing in general. But um, can you talk about kind of like what testing strategies you found useful in React applications in general? Okay, so to, to talk about testing, I just want to introduce a, a, a project that I've been working on um, and that I authored by the time I started working with React, and I've been developing in parallel ever since. Um, this project is called React Cosmos, and what it does is it it helps you load your components in isolation, so it's like a component explorer. Um, and so at this point, I'm talking about manual testing. So it allows you to to open up each component and provide a fixture for it, which is just a just a set of mocks 
So when you're talking about React, you're talking about props or state or more high level stuff like Redux state, or maybe even just mocking uh, endpoint requests and um, local storage, anything like that. So from the get go, when I, when I envisioned working with React, I was thinking about testing and how to make my life easier based on my previous experience. And the main, the, the main insight for me was just component driven development was being able to, to pinpoint any, any error or any uh, behavior with one component and then being able to go straight on that component and work with it separately and test it separately. So at, at first this, this project was not very, uh, Fancy. It was just you'd have a URL for every component, and then that would load the component with some mock data. Uh, but then this project evolved, uh, and now it's it's gotten pretty complex. It's got a lot of functionality. But the reason why I wanted to to, to mention this is because I haven't thought about it as as a automated testing tool until recently, when I started um, consulting again. So I've, I've, I've been working with this uh, company from Toronto and they, they're starting uh, from scratch with React as well. They, they wanted somebody with uh, experience who's done this before. They wanted to make sure that they start with the best practices and a lot of this included testing. So I got in their team as a contractor, but I was pretty close with their, uh, like even their agile practices and staying in touch with everything they're adding to the code base. And I realized that the, the main issue that they were facing developing React was testing. So I made it my mission to kind of solve this for them. It's not something that you can solve 100% and then never have to worry about. It's an ongoing process, but just make sure that they have a straightforward way to do it. Because a lot of the time when you're testing, um, you just... You just don't know how to test something. It's, it's many times it's much easier to, to write the implementation and not the tests, which is why a lot of people just give up. So as I was, uh, I was trying to also understand what the pains are because sometimes when you have more experience, um, you're used to doing complex stuff and you think it's easy, but you have to work with people who are doing them for the first time to see. Um, their reaction. So I realized that uh, when it comes to testing, you can generally divide it in maybe three main steps. And the first one is just the setup. So getting, um, when you're talking about component testing is just getting the component in the state that you want it to be in. And then the second step is maybe an action. So you press a button, you open like uh, a drop down, or you fill in some text in a check in a in an input, and then the third step is the assertion. So based on the the action, you want to see that something happened, and it turns out that the step two and three are pretty easy because you have testing libraries that help you do this, uh, like Enzyme, for example. So it's it's fairly easy to to either do an action uh, and also to to write an assertion. So by far the hardest part of testing was the setup because there was no simple way to do this and it, it kind of differs from uh, situation to situation. Like if you just have a, a button component, then that's simple. You just write down the, the JSX for that and maybe pass in some props. But if you have something that maybe does like a server request. As soon as you're going to put that into a test, you're going to see that you're probably got an error. Like you're going to get an error, like fetch is not defined in this testing environment. And even if it is, then it's not going to respond. You're going to get a 404. So what people do usually is they just stick with testing. The, the simple components, the one that just don't do any, uh, server requests, they don't have any connection to the Redux state and all that, and just test their, what you usually call a UI library. So your buttons, your dropdowns, which is pretty cool. It's, it's, um, 
it wasn't so easy to do this before React and component-driven libraries. But I think it just misses the main benefit, which is testing your more complex components and the, mo the most complex part of your app. So the, the epiphany for me was when I realized that Cosmos, and there are also tools like this, like Storybook, um, they already do this thing. They already do the setup part because they're able to load your component in the browser. So all I needed to do was figure out how to reuse the setup part and put it in automated tests. So in something like uh, Jest or Mocha or uh, whatever you're using to, to write automated tests. And this was a, a very, uh, um, I don't know, re rewarding experience for me because in the process of consulting for this company, I, I kind of... Uh, expanded the Cosmos project and turned it into something that you can use both for manual testing and for automated testing, and then pursued to, um, to convert the code base into writing Cosmos driven tests, which uh, reuse the same setup that they were already using to, to mock their components in the UI. And then they just start from there and then they just do basic assertions and Again, there's no, um, but there's no, um, like one solution that fixes all your problems. But I have to say the life, uh, their life become much easier after that point. And I've been using this in all my projects ever since. So is this kind of like that you're mentioning? Is this just a solution that you found that works really well? that is like a paradigm or is there an actual framework that people can use to kind of take this exact approach? And is it the one that you're talking about that, um, that you've created? Well, it's de there's definitely a framework. I wouldn't call it a framework because it's like a dev tool. It complements what you already do. So you can always uh, plug it out of your code base if you want to, except your test won't work anymore, but your code will still work. So yeah, you can do this with, Cosmos, because what Cosmos does is, well, over the years, it developed into, a, you could call it a mocking platform. So it's a platform that you can use uh, to mock your component because it has plugins. So, for example, now there's, there's uh, somebody, a good friend of mine, who is working really hard to make a, an excellent uh, plugin that helps you mock GraphQL queries. So you can mock at any level. You don't you don't have to mock the, the API response. You can mock the, the GraphQL query or you can mock the state uh, if you want. So there's there's a framework for this if you're using React. It doesn't work with React Native yet, although this is the, the highest uh, request from the community. But it's also uh, something to consider regardless of the technologies that you use. It's just figuring out that Unless you have a straightforward way to reproduce any state uh, that you want to test, testing is going to be a pain because the the state you're going to want to put your app or your component in, and it's, you're going to have a hard time just making the test setup. And that's the key element in the step entry. Those are pretty straightforward and I don't see people struggle with as much as I would just setting it up. Yeah, so I'm checking out React Cosmos now, uh, right now. This is interesting. It's interesting that I've actually never heard of this until now. Um, so this kind of would work with any other testing framework, I guess. So you could use this with Jest or you could use this with, with Mocha or anything like that. Is, that. is that right? This is just kind of for creating, creating reusable components. Yeah, so f first of all, you can use it without writing automated tests, you can just write those fixtures, which is a, 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 just a JSON object that describes your state where you can put props on, or other stuff. So you write your fixture and then you can load the component in the UI. And this is, you can say for free, you don't have to do anything else. Uh, the, the, the tool just picks up all your fixtures and shows them into a pretty UI. But then if you want to write tests, um, yes, you can um, start using the test API with Mocha 
and you can do your uh, or with just you can do your sessions with um whatever you want but i have to say the test api does have some uh additional functionality that uh is compatible with jest so if you use jest you're going to you're going to get a bit more functionality but it's not it's not a big difference for example if you put callbacks into your fixtures so if you have a component that uh has uh, function props and um the the cosmos test api will automatically wrap those into just um mock functions so you don't have to do it yourself so then when you when you do actions in your component and they end up calling those callback props uh those will automatically be mock functions and you can just uh run assertions and say expect props dot on change to have been called with uh which is just a convenient thing otherwise you'd have to 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 define that that prop as a as a mock yourself that's really really nice that's that's awesome i'm surprised that i've also never heard of this but yeah it seems really valuable so to make sure i understand this is kind of like bridging the gap between writing you know just snapshot tests and then something you do with um, storybook, which I've got experience kind of uh, building out that UI, kind of um, bringing that where storybook is, it's valuable in that you can build a component uh, in a very simple way. And like you've got all that data set up so you can just click through the different iterations of that or the different versions. Um, but rather than having to go through and kind of as you're modifying those components, what Cosmos does is basically automates that via its use of these fixtures. Is that correct? Um, kind of. So it's, uh, I'll, I'll continue comparing it to Storybook because I think that's a, an easy way to explain it since uh, uh, you have experience with Storybook and a lot of people also have. So the, um, the hardest part with Cosmos is that you it introduces this concept of fixtures so whereas in, in Storybook, if you want to define a story, you just write the JSX. So in my mind, that is just a fixture with props. And the reason why Cosmos has this uh, another abstraction called a fixture is because you many times it's props are not enough to, to define what the state of that component should be. And I think you can do this with Storybook as well because you have this uh, decorators and stuff. But with Cosmos, once you get the hang of this fixture, which is just an object, like a JavaScript JSON object, um, then you, you realize that it's very powerful. You can put props, you can put state, and we're going to just inject the local state for you or Redux state. And if you set it up as a plugin, we're going to just decorate it with like a... Uh, a fake provider and put that data into the provi- into the provider's store, and then what the component will experience is the same um, uh, context that it will experience in the real life app, but it's going to be loaded by itself. So, uh, so the main difference is is how you define the state. You have this fixture, mm. but then the the second part is that you can take this fixture and use it like an API programmatically and use it to to start writing automated tests. But you mentioned snapshots, and that's all also something you can do. And I think this is pretty similar to Storybook. If you don't want to write like automated tests yourself, but you want to use it like a, maybe like a style guide kind of thing, um, you'll still get a snapshot test for every fixture that you define out of the box. So it's not ideal because you're going to get a, a huge snapshot with all your components and this thing is going to be a pain. But if you don't write any tests and you still get this, it's better than nothing. And usually when I have like a pet project and uh, I just play around and do something for fun, this provides a lot of value because I, I know whenever something changes based on the snapshot. And I don't have to write anything else other than just those fixtures that define the props and state and so on. Does that make it clear for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think it's 
I, I know personally, like I've had issues trying to figure out like what is the right way or it might just be me being lazy, honestly, of like actually testing UI components. <laughs> because like you were saying earlier, I would often find myself, I'll, I'll just, I would write tests for the simple components just to say like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm doing good. I'm writing tests for my app. I'm making sure things will uh, work well in the future. But, you know, in the back of my mind, I knew that these things that I'm testing, they're not actually the complex parts. Um, and I think one of the things that was stopping me there is just how do I actually approach that? So, yeah, just the way you've described the way Cosmos works, I think um, it's definitely something I'm going to look forward to on a React project that should be starting the next month or so, I think, um, can really be valuable in testing what actually needs to be tested, those uh, more important pieces of the app. Cool. Yeah, that's the experience I've had with um, other um, code bases that I've saw is that people just give up testing because, uh, and it's not that they, they're lazy or anything, it's that it's a road that hasn't been paved. And whereas writing a, a React component is such a breeze and it's so easy to do it, testing it is can really be cumbersome. So it's just going to feel like you're wasting time at that point. And there's no clear st- solution when you just... So you write the JSX for your component and then you get like uh, a bunch of errors that are related to like maybe um, some localization context or some theme that you're using uh, throughout your app using context and all that. And at that point, it just uh, it would become your full-time job just to understand how to mock those things and how to make your component work in that environment. So this is why I, I found it so valuable to invest in this and find a solution that makes this straightforward. So I'd be happy to hear your feedback if you try it out and and learn how, how it helped you. Yeah, I'll be sure to pass that along once I dive into it. I'm excited to do so. So I'm kind of curious. Uh, we're getting close on time, so we'll probably wrap it up here in just a second. But in, in, in order of importance, like what should someone test if they're building a React application in order of like most to least important in your, in your opinion? I would say as um, something more high level would definitely uh, be more valuable, especially if you have to choose. So ideally, we all want to write unit tests and integration tests and end-to-end tests, but the reality is that most of the times you have to choose, so that's why your your question is so powerful. And oh, I've I've gone through many s- stages um, in terms of how I would answer these questions. I've been a fan of you a long time, but I've come to realize that if if those are the only tests that you're gonna write, uh, you're better off uh, writing more higher level tests. So if if you had to choose, I would say maybe even not even component tests. So just write some um, like acceptance tests for your entire app. Like just make sure that the the login works, make sure that the create page works, and all that. And you can use something like Cypress for that or um, Selenium. And but I I, I usually use that to to cover up what you would call the smoke test. So it's just making sure that my deploy didn't completely break the app. So it, that the main page loads, that maybe the key areas still work, like like I said, authentication and maybe some other key action. But I don't go more narrow than that when it comes to end-to-end tests because I'm a big believer of component-driven development and being able to test those separately. So once I cover up that that main thing, that make sure that the glue that keeps everything together is still is still okay. Once I deploy, I focus on component tests. But again, I think there's a lot of controversy here because um, one might think of component tests as unit tests, but then if they see uh, how I 
test components uh, or how you would do it with something like Cosmos is that you actually mock um, Redux and you mock server requests and you mock a lot of things. And um, you, you also test your components with all the decorators that it uses, which is very common. So more often than not, a component will also have this higher order components around it. So if you if you debug your component, you'll actually realize that it's five components instead of one, but the the four ones are just decorators. So you might say at this point that this is more of an integration test, and I I don't I don't care honestly. I maybe it's just um it's just more valuable to do the integration test here because it's closer to to the unit that you're going to reuse. Whereas unit tests are really useful for, for functions and for, for certain parts of your app that are very complex, uh, but very isolated. But I, I think it provides a lot of um, false positives and it just uh, taps into our confirmation bias because we, we see that some tests pass, but in fact, that code um, is is too too isolated from the rest of the app to provide a lot of value. So I would say to answer your question, uh, I would start with end-to-end -end tests, and then I would write um, integration tests for a component using something like the techniques that I described, where you mock the component entirely and not just extract the um, like the stateless bits and test those. Very good info. That's really interesting to hear. And um, I kind of have heard a few different opinions on this subject. And um, everyone has their own twist on it. But um, I think I've, I have heard similar things. Like if you are going to test just a small bit of your application, it's not really worth it to just go in and try to do a unit test here and there. It's better to kind of have the end-to-end -end or integration test. But if you're going to spend the time to, to do everything, then definitely add the unit test. So that's kind of along similar lines. But it's cool to hear, you know, coming from your own, you know, your own background and kind of your reasoning behind it. It makes a lot of sense. So, um, cool. yeah, I think we're going to go ahead and get to the picks. Um, is there anything else that you want to talk about before we wrap wrap up, Avidju? Sure. I want to I wanna share something with your audience that, that they might find fun. Um, I've been working on this game in built with React um, for the most part of this year. Um, and just a, a quick story about it. It's So I've written a, a, like a Tetris game with React a while ago, just to showcase some of the things that I've been working with and to learn some technologies better, just as an excuse. So now I wanted to, to for, for whatever reason, I wanted to build something with WebSockets and uh, I wanted to do some backend work because I haven't done uh, like Node in, in a long time. So maybe because the, e, the new year changed and I often want to do to try out something new when the year starts, I went on and um, turned this single player Tetris game into a multiplayer Tetris game, which is fun because there's no such thing, so I have to invent some logic, some game dynamics. And I'm not going to go much deeper into this, but if anyone wants to try it, they can just go to flatris.space, which is an un unusual domain. But um, I think they're going to find it a lot of fun. Very interesting. Can you repeat the domain just to make sure everyone got that out? Maybe spell it out. Yeah, so it's F L A T I S Flatris dot space. Okay, cool. Um, that sounds very cool. I'm gonna check it out. So Spencer, do you have any picks today? Yeah, I'm my pick's gonna be one that I'm sure has been brought up time and time again, but um it's snack by expo, snack.expo.io. Um I get a lot of people who ask me kind of React Native questions, and Snack is just such an incredible way to, um, one, share React Native code, and two, to really, it kind of forces you to distill down an issue within your application that may not actually be a bug 
you know, in React Native or library you're using, but actually in the code you've written. So Snack has been great just for sharing code and then also for like kind of teaching people how to debug. So if you ever want to work with anyone on a React Native project but don't want to set the whole uh, whole shebang up, snack.expo.io. Cool. Awesome. Um, Avidji, do you have any other picks? Not really. I just I just want to say that um, I that I'm calling from Thailand and that probably my connection isn't ideal. So I apologize for for anybody listening if I'm getting cut off at some point. I hope it's not too big of a problem. Cool. Yeah, I think I think it was not bad. Uh, I think we had maybe one or two small parts where it cut out a little bit, but overall, I think we got a good a good recording. Um, and again, thanks for coming on. So. <laughs> Yeah, t- thanks for having me. This was this is super fun. I've never done this before, and I'm um, happy to have met you and had this conversation. It was fun. Um, so I have a pick. My pick is the city of New Orleans. Um, I just got back from a trip there for two days. It's kind of it's really close for me. I only live like two and a half hours away, but it's a good, it's a really cool place if you can have any like excuse to go down there. I know there's a conference coming there. Um, it's called Collision Conference, actually, and that's coming up in the next couple of months. And I also think there is um, a JavaScript conference. I think it's Jazz something along the lines of Jazz JS or something like that. I can't remember, but if you Google around like JavaScript conference in New Orleans, you'll find it. So that might be a reason to go down there. But even if you don't go down there for a conference, you just go down there, hang out for a couple of days. Um, really good food, not too expensive, and we had a lot of fun. So I recommend checking it out. Well, um, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up. That ends episode 91 of React Native Radio. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you all next week.